Well, good evening. On January 10th of last year, the University of Georgia's football team ended a 41-year drought by winning the college football national championship. The Georgia Bulldogs defeated the well-known Alabama Crimson Tide with a final score of 33-18. to Now, because I grew up in Georgia and because I'm also a Bulldog fan, I can personally tell you that this was one of the greatest victories that Georgia had ever experienced. You see, Georgia hadn't won the national championship since 1980. That's 15 years before I was born. Not only that, but they also had a long history of losses to Alabama. The most recent loss was in the SEC championship in December of 2021, where the Bulldogs, who were highly favored, fell to the Crimson Tide once again. After this loss, I think it's fair to say that Georgia fans lost hope and doubted that their team would ever be able to conquer Alabama. But that doubt was completely washed away on January 10th of last year, because with only one minute left to play, Georgia's defense made an incredible interception and returned it for a touchdown to seal the deal. Finally, after all these years, Georgia defeated their great foe, Alabama, and won the championship. Now, as you can imagine, fans were elated. Some people cried and some people shouted for joy. I mean, even my adult brother danced around his living room in celebration. So what's my point? Well, great joy leads people to action. You see, no one had to force Georgia fans to celebrate after the win. I certainly didn't have to demand my brother to get off his couch and dance around his living room. No, his actions flowed from a heart that was full of joy. And tonight we're going to see how great joy leads people to take real actions in the book of Colossians. So let me invite you to open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, there are three points to my sermon tonight. Number one, ministers of the gospel. Number two, rejoicing in the gospel. And number three, application of the gospel. So follow along as I read, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is who's writing the letter. Verse 1 tells us that Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, is the author of Colossians. And with him is Timothy, Paul's disciple. But what do we know about Paul? Well, in the book of Acts, we learn that Paul, formerly called Saul, was a Jewish Pharisee who persecuted the church of Christ. But in Acts chapter nine, Paul saved, God saved Paul on the road to Damascus and called him to be a minister to the church that he once hated. God turns an enemy of the church into a leader of the church. So the one who once hated Christians now joyfully ministers to Christians. But where was Paul when he wrote the letter? Well, just flip to the end of the book with me to look at chapter 4 and verse 18. Chapter 4, verse 18. Paul writes, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. And so we see that Paul's writing this letter from prison. Now there's some debate among scholars about which prison Paul was writing from. Most believe that it was while he was imprisoned in Rome. But even though we can't know for sure the prison location, we can know with certainty the reason for Paul's imprisonment. 
based on other writings from Paul, we can conclude that Paul was in prison because he was a minister of the gospel. Just listen to these words that he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Paul says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. Did you catch that? Paul's in chains as a prisoner because of his bold proclamation of the gospel. And so Paul's the one writing the letter from prison. But who is he writing the letter to? Well, in verse 2, Paul says of chapter 1, you can flip back, Paul says that he's writing to the saints and the faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. And from what we can see in the letter, the Colossians were a group of people who had come to faith through a man named Epaphras. Paul makes it clear that Epaphras was the first one to bring the good news of the gospel to Colossae. Just look with me at verses 5 through 7. Starting in verse 5, Paul says, Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Praise God for Epaphras. And so we see that the gospel came to Colossae through the faithful ministry of Epaphras. Epaphras is the mouthpiece of the gospel and the word of truth goes forth with power. Praise God. The gospel goes forward and a new church is born. All great news. So then why did Paul write the letter to the Colossians? Well, it seemed that Paul was motivated by joy. Just listen to what he said in verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. And so Paul's rejoicing. He's he's rejoicing as he prays for these believers. But why is he joyful? Well, in verse 8, it says, Because Epaphras had made known to Paul the good work that is happening in Colossae. So the joy of this news leads Paul to take action. But that's not the only reason Paul writes, because in chapter 2, We learn that false teachings are slipping in, which threaten to distort the word of truth, the gospel. Now, there are multiple opinions from scholars as to the precise nature of these false teachings, and we don't have time to unpack all of them tonight, but I think it's important to at least read the different teachings that Paul addresses in the letter. So please turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to begin in verse 16. We're just going to look at the Three texts that where Paul describes the false teachings. Starting in verse 16, he says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink, or with regard to festival or new moon or Sabbath. Now look at verse 18. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions um, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. Now, verse 20, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to the things that all perish as they are used. According to human precepts and teachings, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. That's a lot. But we can clearly see that there are teachings and practices that are coming into the church that include legalism, paganism, and asceticism. Now, we're going to hear much more about these teachings in just a few weeks. But for now, you should know that each one of these teachings, in one way or another, directly come against the truth of the gospel. And so Paul writes to confront these false teachings because they threaten to mislead people and they steal the joy that both he and the Colossians are experiencing. But Paul doesn't begin by hammering falsehood. No, he begins 
by rejoicing in the fact that the gospel is bearing fruit in Colossae, in the world, and in Epaphras. So point number two, rejoicing in the gospel. Starting in in verse three of chapter one, Paul says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. So Paul begins by telling the Colossians that he's always giving thanks to God when he prays for them. But what exactly is he thankful for? Well, just look at verse four of the same, right after verse three, it says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the, all the saints. So Paul gives two reasons for his thankfulness. Reason number one is because their faith is in Jesus. Now we know that faith is a gift from God according to Ephesians 2.8. And Romans 10.17 also teaches us that faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of Christ. And what is the word of Christ? Well, it's the gospel, the reality that God sent his only son, Jesus, to bear the punishment for sin on the cross and to offer life for all who would trust in him. So Paul gives thanks to God because the Colossians have heard this good news and they've put their faith in Christ alone for salvation. But we also see that their faith isn't dead. No, it's alive and it's working. Paul says he gives thanks for their faith in Jesus and their love for one another. Now, if we say that they love one another, we can also conclude that they love God. We can say this because 1 John 4.20 teaches us that if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Did you hear that? You cannot say that you love God and hate your brother or sister in Christ. You either love God and therefore you love his people or you hate God and therefore hate his people. There's no middle ground. But Paul makes it clear that the Colossians love God and they love one another. And why do they love God? Because God first loved them by sending Jesus to die in their place. Or in other words, the joy of being saved and loved by God leads the Colossians to love one another. Their joy in the gospel results in real action. They actually love one another. He's not just saying that. So let me pause and ask you a question. Do you resonate, do you resonate with the Colossians? Is your faith in Christ alone for salvation? Are you experiencing the joy of being loved by God and does it lead you to love his people? Because as we've seen, joy in Christ leads to actions. So if the answer is no, you don't love God and no, you don't love his people, then I would invite you to repent of your sins and trust in Christ for salvation. He is able and willing to save you from the wrath of God if you will trust in him. And so I would invite you right now, where you are, sitting where you are, I don't care how long you've been in church, if you've never trusted in Jesus, then do it now. Turn from your sins and look to Christ. So Paul rejoices in prayer because of the good work that's happening in this church. And this isn't... forceful prayer like you and I are guilty of doing sometimes. You know what I mean. God, I just thank you for so and so. They are such a blessing to me. (laughs) No, Paul's truly joyful because the gospel is on display in Colossae. And we know that this thankfulness is genuine by the way Paul speaks. He says he's always giving thanks, meaning these believers are constantly in the mind or on the mind of Paul. They are dear to his heart. They're a joy to him. They're not a burden. And so Paul is truly joyful because of the faith and the love that is evident in the Colossians. But where does their faith and love come from? What's fueling these two things? What's behind them? Well, just look at what Paul says in the beginning of verse five. He says, because, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. 
So the faith and love in Colossae are flowing from their eternal hope that is laid up for them in heaven. This is the hope that every believer in Christ gets to experience because everyone who has been saved by the blood of Jesus will spend eternity in God's presence without the guilt and shame of sin. Just think about that. If you're in Christ, you're going to be with him forever. You're going to behold his glory face to face. He will be our God and we will be his people. We will live with him in fullness of joy without pain and sorrow of our sin. There is no greater hope than to know that after our hearts stop beating on this earth, we will see our savior face to face and live with him for all eternity. It is this reality that produces faith in Jesus and love for others. But Paul makes it clear that this hope is directly connected to the truth of the gospel. Follow along as I read verses five through seven again, and just listen, just listen to how often Paul refers to the gospel. Listen, it says, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world, it, the word of the truth, the gospel, is bearing fruit and increasing. As it, the word of the truth, the gospel also does among you. Since the day you heard it, the word of the truth, the gospel, and understood the grace of God and truth. Just as you learned it, the word of the truth, the gospel, from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Did you hear how many times Paul referred to the gospel? And notice that the word of, what the word of truth is doing, it's saving people in Colossae. It's bearing fruit, and that fruit is increasing. But what is the fruit? Well, Paul just told us in verse four. It's faith in Jesus, love for God, and love for one another. And so God is saving sinners. He's opening their eyes to the reality of sin and their need for a savior. People are repenting of sin, turning to Christ, and this is resulting in love for God and love for others. And so Paul rejoices when he hears that the gospel is bearing fruit that increases in Colossae. You know, one of my favorite things to do in New England is to go apple picking in the fall. My family and I love to walk around the orchards and, you know, search for the best apple and the best tree. Um, now, everyone knows that the best fruit comes from the healthiest trees, and the healthiest trees have the best roots. Well, the same is true for you and I as believers. We must be rooted in the hope of the gospel in order to bear good fruit. So let me ask you, are you bearing good fruit? Can others look at your life and clearly see that your faith is in Jesus? That you deeply love him and you love his church? Is it evident by the way that you live? Now we also see in our passage that the gospel doesn't stop in Colossae. Because in verse 6, Paul rejoices that the gospel is bearing fruit in the whole world. That means that the gospel is going to other cities in different places and people are coming to faith. And like in Colossae, this faith results in love for God and love for others. And so the gospel is going forth and new churches are being planted around the world. Brothers and sisters, notice the gospel doesn't stay local. No, it's good news. And this good news reaches to the ends of the earth. And so let me ask you, do you rejoice when you hear that the gospel is going forth in places like Cameroon, Africa, or London, England, or are you apathetic toward global mission? Are you working hard to see the gospel go to the nations of the world? Are you yourself willing to go to the foreign nations of the world in order that the gospel may go to places it's never been before? That's a real question to ask yourself and myself. We love to talk, but we must ask ourselves the question, are we willing to take it where it's never been? I mean, just look at the example of Epaphras, beginning in verse 7. Paul says, just as you learned it, the word of truth, the gospel from Epaphras, 
our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so get this. Epaphras didn't have a seminary degree, but what he did have was the good news of Jesus, which he faithfully ministered in Colossae. And as a result, a new church was born. Now, I'm not arguing that you should avoid formal training. What I am saying is that you and I have the great joy and privilege to preach the gospel to those who have never heard. For some of us, that looks like staying in Windsor, Connecticut, so that this community can hear the good news of the gospel. But for others, that looks like being sent out to help plant churches in maybe Manchester or maybe moving overseas so that people in every nation and in every place can hear of Jesus. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So those who have the spirit of Jesus and who are filled with joy because of the gospel, they will take real action to see the good news spread throughout the whole world. Just like God used Epaphras to bring the good news of Jesus to Colossae. And people came to faith. And later in the end of the book, chapter four, verses 12 and 13, we learn that Epaphras worked hard for the maturity of the believers. Meaning he didn't just preach the gospel and then bail. No, he continued to minister and work hard to disciple the believers. And as a result, the Colossians loved God and they loved one another. So what do we do with all of this? Now, three specific applications of the gospel. Number one, we should rejoice in the gospel. Number two, we should minister the gospel. And number three, we should pray fervently for gospel fruit, both here in Connecticut and to the ends of the earth. If you remember, I began tonight by telling you a true story of how a football team victory led to a great joy which resulted in real action. Brothers and sisters, we have a much greater story. The good news of Jesus' death in our place so that we can stand justified before God is far greater. And so we should rejoice with great joy. That means when life gives you a reason to complain, and it will, we need to remember the victory of the cross and the hope that is laid up for us in heaven. So when you receive your motor vehicle tax from the state of Connecticut and you're tempted to complain, you should rejoice. Or when you've changed the fifth diaper of that day and you want to grumble, you should rejoice. Why? Because we're loved by God. We must remember the truth of the gospel and meditate upon it until our hearts sing with thanksgiving to God. George Mueller, a man greatly used by God to care for thousands of orphans, put it this way. I saw more clearly than ever that the first great and primary business to which I ought to attend every day was to have my soul happy in the Lord. And so we must be people who meditate upon the truth of the gospel until our hearts rejoice in God. And don't stop at rejoicing but spend your lives ministering so that people who have never heard the good news can experience salvation and the hope of eternal life. Like Epaphras, minister the gospel to people who have never heard. And if you don't know where to start, open your front door and look at the neighbors around you. Start there. And if God calls you, pack your bags and move to other places around the world because the gospel is not just local good news, it's global good news. And finally, let's be a church that prays for gospel fruit. Pray that the gospel would bear this type of fruit in your own life, in my life. Pray that the gospel would bear this type of fruit at our church, proclamation. And pray that the gospel would bear this fruit in every nation around the world, all to the glory of Jesus. Let's pray to that end. God, we rejoice 
that the Colossians heard the good news of Jesus and they repented of their sins and they trusted by your grace and they were transformed. We rejoice that Paul could rejoice with chains that the gospel was going forth and Epaphras could work hard to see that happen. We're so thankful, Lord, that this gospel is not just good news for our community, but it's good news that goes to the ends of the earth. And God, it is so easy, just speaking for myself, and I know people probably can resonate with me, that we would just sit back and sit on the bleachers and watch others take that role of ministering the gospel. And I just pray that you would inflame our hearts tonight Awaken us, dear Lord, that we would be people who love our neighbors, who love the people that you have surrounded us with, and who preach the gospel faithfully, that your name may be spread throughout the earth. God, we pray for that fruit. We pray for that fruit in my life. I pray for it in my life. I pray for it in the brothers and sisters in front of me, that, that you would give them great faith in Jesus, and that their love for God would abound, and their love for one another would grow daily, that we would see that fruit explode here in the church in Windsor in Manchester, in, in all parts of Connecticut. And God, that we would see this fruit go to the hardest places of the earth. That healthy churches would be planted in North Africa and Asia and other parts of the world who don't have clear proclamation of the gospel. And God, that all this would take place so that your son may receive the glory due his name. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what took place in Colossae. We thank you that it's still advancing right now in our world today. In Jesus' name, amen.